Good mobile apps have become synonymous with simple UI and sleek animations. All the development frameworks provide easy ways to implement good looking UI and cover all the expected animations. And Flutter is no exception. Now when I say the expected animations, I'm talking about animations like these. These are animations that you would expect a UI element to go through. These kind of animations are extremely useful for providing context and feedback to the users. And it's more than enough to deliver a great mobile app. But sometimes... Sometimes we want to do a little bit more. You could argue that the morphing and the physics effects provide more context and better feedback. But I would consider that to be a lie. This is something else. This is a designer or developer that wants to do something creative. For the context today, we'll be calling these abnormal animations. Flutter provides great ways for us to create normal animations. They just come with a lot of boilerplate code. For an abnormal animation like this, you would require a lot of code to animate it. Devs usually look at animations like this from a designer and say, well that's pretty, but it's not realistic to do in code. Each of the menu items would need the to line in the slightly icon has to be straight straight to and and our path has to bend and to scale in and a little tab bit to do a little splash at the end. And for each of these animation pieces, you would have to sync it up and provide an animation controller, keep track of that controller, provide your tween animation, keep it all in sync, give it its own ticker mix and you get the point. This is where Flare comes in and also why this tutorial exists. Flare is a design and animation tool created by two dimensions that help you add high quality animations to your app. They have a flutter package that allows you to play these animations. Let's take this animation. It has the button, then it has this toolbar with some icons on it. What if we want to interact with those icons? My name is Dane from Fullstacks, and in this tutorial, we'll be adding some interactive areas to our flare animations. One more thing before we get started, please subscribe and like this video. If you'd like to follow along with this tutorial, head over to github.com slash Fullstacks forward slash flutter dash tutorials. Start this repo and then clone it, then open up Flutter Flare Part 1 and drag the start folder into your IDE. We'll start by doing all of our setup. We'll include Flare Flutter in our pop spec and we'll also include our animations from the assets folder. And that's all for our setup. Head over to the Flare demo file, import the Flare actor and add it as the body of our Flare demo state. When you run this code you should now see a large purple background with a static image of our animation file. There's nothing playing in the animation because we haven't defined our starting animation. We can set our animation property to let our flare actor play our initial animation. We will change our animation property to activate and when you save you should see the animation play out. The next step would be to toggle our animation. So we wanted to swap between activate and deactivate. We will add a boolean value called isOpen and we'll swap our animation key based on the isOpen value. Then we want to wrap our flare actor with a gesture detector and on tap we want to toggle the is open value within our set state function. After you've saved and you tap on your screen you should see your activate and deactivate animation play out. That seemed a little bit too easy but there's still a few things left. The one big question is how am I going to interact with different parts of my animation if it's all one animation. For this we'll start looking at the gesture detector. The gesture detector provides you with an on tap up function callback. This callback also has a value that provides you with touch information. This touch information contains our global touch position and that's what we'll use to figure out which animation we want to play based on where we touch our current animation. Let's get a visual representation of what we would like to happen on our animation. We'll divide our animation into two sections. We have a bottom section and a top section. Then our top section will be divided into three different touch areas. The bottom section will toggle between activate and our deactivate keys. Then each of those top three sections will map to the tapped animations that we have within our file. To perform all of these actions we would need our local position and not our global position. The local position means that is the position tapped in our animation element instead of on the entire screen. In Flutter, when you want to get your local position, you need to use your render object. 
This render object can be retrieved through the build context. The way our code is currently set up, if we get our render object, our global position will be the same as the local position. We can fix this by moving the flare actor and our gesture detector into its own stateful widget. We'll start by creating a new file called smart flutter animation dot dot. We'll import the material package and then create a stateful widget called smart flare animation. This widget will return a container of width 295 and height 251. These values correspond to the artboard dimensions as you can see in the animation file. We'll move over all our code from our flare demo file into our child widget. We then copy our is open boolean and import our flare actor file. We can then head over to our flare demo and we can replace all of our gesture detector code with our smart flare animation. When you save and run this code, you'll see that the animation is a little bit smaller and it also moved up to the top of our view. We want the animation to be at the bottom center, so we'll wrap our smart flare animation with an align widget and we'll set the alignment to bottom center. Now we can start adding our custom touch logic. Head over to the smart flare animation file and change your on tap to on tap up and then pass in a parameter called tap info. This parameter contains the global position of our touch. To get our local position, we'll get the render box of our current object using our build context and we'll map that to our local position through the global to local position function. Once we have our local position, we now want to figure out where did we actually touch this animation. Based on this little visual thing I showed you earlier, there's only a few things we need to know. We want to know if our top half was touched and for that we'll use the Y offset and check if it's less than the animation height divided by 2. Then we want to know if our left side was touched. For this we'll check the X offset and see if it's less than our animation width divided by 3. Then we'll check if the right side was touched. We'll again use the, the X offset and we'll check the animation width divided by 3 times 2. And lastly we can check if our middle was touched by checking if the left side was not touched and if the right side was not touched. At this point we have all the information we need so we can start adding in our if statements. The first one we want to check is if the left side was touched and it was in the top half. That will be the top left so we'll print out top left. Second we'll check if the middle was touched and if it's in the top half. We'll do the same for the top right. Within the last statement, we'll determine state by checking if our button is open or not. And at the end of this, we'll always toggle the is open value. This all needs to happen in the set state function, so we can take our set state from below and we can move it to the top of our function. When you run this now, you should still see the same behavior. But additionally, if you click on any of those toolbar actions at the top, you'll see it print out the values that we put into our print statements. Next up, we need to start playing multiple animations. So we'll need something better than a boolean to represent our state. We'll create a new enum called animation to play. This enum will have activate, deactivate, camera tap, pulse tapped and image tapped values. We'll then add a new member variable called animation to play and give it a default value of deactivate. We also need to add a string mapping. We need to map the animation to play value to our animation keys. For this function, we'll use a switch statement. For each of the cases, we'll map the enum value to a key in the animation. Then we'll add another function where we will set our animation name within set state. Now that we have this, we can call our set animation to play function with the appropriate enum. We'll replace all of our print statements with the set animation to play function call and passing in our enum values. The last thing we have to do is to replace our key for animation in the Flutter actor with a get animation function that we just created. And if you save and run this code, you should be able to interact with every item on the animation. Now there's two problems we still have left. By relying on the set state to change our animation, we can only play the same animation once in a row. The second problem we have is that we can start playing animations even if it's not in the correct state. By touching the toolbar actions while it's closed, you can still play those animations. To fix the first problem, we'll start using the flare controls. We'll import our flare controls and create a new member variable called animation controls. We'll give this controller to the flare actor and then we'll replace the code in our set animation to play with a call to the controller to play the animation. You should now be able to tap the same animation multiple times in a row and it should still play fine. The second problem will be unique for each animation. For this specific animation, 
we don't want to play any of the tapped animation if the toolbar is hidden. What this means in code is that if the last played animation was deactivated, we don't want to play the tapped animations. We'll start by adding a last played animation to the top of our class. We'll then set the last played animation after we play our actual animation. We then want to figure out if it is a tapped animation. For that we'll get the name of the animation and then check if it contains underscore tapped. For the final check we want to check if it is a tapped animation and if the last played animation was deactivated then we want to return from this function and not play the animation that we intend to play. With those changes you shouldn't be able to play your tapped animations when the toolbar has been deactivated. This was a UI experiment that I started because I wanted to create a larger style animation for something that I'm working on. When building something like this in code, it actually takes a lot of code to get it done. It's not that it's difficult, it's that it's a lot of boilerplate code to keep track of and you have less freedom than creating this animation in a cool tool like Flare. During this tutorial, I was also inspired to create a package to help other devs do this. This package would take away all of the setup and boilerplate code that we just went through and it will give you an even more reliable gesture detection. Let's start by importing the smart flare package and then getting all our packages. My visual studio code was giving problems and so I used my terminal to get my packages. Head over to the flare demo file and import the smart flare object. Let's get the basic setup and then I'll explain to you how the smart flare actor will help us to achieve what we just did in much less code. We'll replace our smart flare animation with a smart flare actor and we'll give it an animation width and height of the same values as our smart flare animation. We'll also provide it with a file name that points to our animation. Saving your code should show us something similar to what we saw at the beginning of this tutorial. Just a purple background with a static state animation being drawn. Smart Flare is a thin wrapper that surrounds the Flare Actor. The Flare Actor is placed at the bottom of a stack and on top of that we put containers with gesture detectors attached to it. These containers are called active areas. For each active area you can provide a callback, you can provide one animation name to play or you can provide a list of animations to cycle through when touching this active area. So let's see how we can use this package. We'll start by giving our Smart Flare Actor a starting animation and we'll give it the deactivate key. Then we'll define a list of active areas that we'll supply to our Smart Flare Actor. The first thing we want to do is give an active area for the part of the animation that represents our actual button that toggles our toolbar. To achieve this, we'll create an active area that covers the bottom half of our animation. We'll give it a lift of zero. We'll give it a top value that starts at half of the animation height. We'll give it the full width of the animation and then we'll give it a height of half the animation's height. We'll set our debug area to true. This active area should cycle through two animations when it's tapped. We'll give it the activate key and the deactivate key. Let's also provide this area with an untapped callback that prints out toggle. Now let's pass these active areas through to our smart flare actor. When you save and run this, you should see a debug area being drawn over the animation. And if you tap within that area, it should be toggling between the activate and the deactivate state. Now that you know how this works, we can then create our active area for our top left area. We'll give this a top and a left value of zero because it starts at the origin of this animation. And we'll give it a width of a third of the animation width and we'll give it a height of half of the animation's height. Since we'll be reusing these values for the next three active areas, we'll create some local variables that will store these values for us. We'll set the debug area true and we'll provide an animation name called camera tapped. There's a problem where sometimes the R3 load functionality doesn't allow you to continue playing the animations. To fix this, just click on the refresh button next to your stop button in the IDE and it should all be playing again. Now that that's in, you should be able to click on that camera tapped area and it'll play the camera tapped animation that we saw earlier in this tutorial. Now at this point we're dealing with the same problem of the camera tapped animation being able to play while the toolbar is closed. To fix this I added a guard coming from property to our active area. The naming is a bit off and I'll change that in the future but what that means is if the last played animation is in the list that you provide to that property then the current animation that you're trying to play won't play. So to guard against our deactivate animation we'll supply an array with a deactivate value in it to our guard coming from property. Now you should see that if you try and tap this value while the button is deactivated, it won't play the camera tapped animation. 
now that we are done with one of the top left active areas, we can copy and paste it because the functionality is exactly the same. The only thing we'll change is the left values and the animation name. For the second active area, we'll set our left value to a third of the animation's width. And for our last active area, we'll set the left value of the active area to a third of the animation's width times two. You should be seeing all the animations play out if you touch any of those areas. Let's remove all the debug values so that we can see the animation how it's supposed to be. And then we are done with this tutorial. Please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you want to see the written tutorials, follow me on Medium since they come out about three to five days before the videos.